So, Glenn, special welcome. Thank you, Anish. Um, it's really a great privilege that you accepted our invitation to visit Ljubljana at the time the exhi exhibition is here. As far as I know, you don't visit other places or most of them. No, so I, I, I'm very restrictive on taking time out from my practice, but uh, I have a great love of your city and, uh, and your people. And uh, there are many friends I have here, so I'm always drawn first and foremost by friends and then their places of residence. And I think this is a marvellous part of the world. Thank you. Uh, look, uh, I was thinking how to start this, and uh, uh, then I thought that uh, in a very short time uh, I would like to tell an anecdote, if you don't mind. <laughs> okay. <laughs> Uh, we were having, having dinner at uh, your house in Sydney and the phone was ringing downstairs. And uh, you behaved like you didn't notice. So I probably said something like the phone was ringing. Or and the, your uh, re response was so unexpected, so surprising. Uh, can you help me what you said? You answered? <laughs> Uh, remind me, but it probably was something like, well, I'm having dinner. You said like, uh, nobody needs me that much. That nobody needs me that much. Oh, yeah, that's at right. At the moment that I would interrupt the pleasant dinner. Yeah, that's correct. Um, why would you answer the phone? It was ringing, just ringing. Um, it's important when you're with friends, to, that's the priority. But we tend to think that the phone has priority. That is stupid. Yeah, exactly. That's what I wanted to hear. Yeah, it is stupid. <laughs> no, but I must say that uh, I don't know any other archi architect that would react like that. So, uh, well, you might think it might be an another new job at eight o'clock at night. <laughs> <laughs> Most no, <laughs> no but many clients would ring to say that my favourite architect. Nothing would more would my favourite architect want is to talk to me about my house, and there's nothing less I would want to talk about at 8 o'clock at night to when I'm having dinner with you, Alish, than, than, uh, than to talk to somebody about their house. So th that's the reality. I think it's a matter of values. Exactly. Yeah, and your values are very, I would say, unique, not common. So the way you live and the way you work is really something special at the moment in the life, uh, in the world, I would say. And Yuhani said that your work is kind of an, how can I say, a critique on the world we live in. Would you agree with that? Well, I've never really thought about that. Um, uh, if he means by that, that uh, I am expressing something that is not um, largely being looked at at the moment and perhaps forgotten, then that makes it, what I'm doing, a critique. And it may be certainly the case that uh, I am not greatly influenced by the latest fashion. The isms have always annoyed me. I remember when that dreadful period that came was postmodernism. I can hardly say the word, it's so awful. Um, that I just got in the back streets in my bike and backpedaled all the way and let all the postmodern go past me. I just couldn't bear it. And there were good architects in the country following this stuff and I thought I don't know what's wrong with them or is there something wrong with me but I said there's no way I cannot do it because I know it is not right and I think it's a really important thing in your value system is that when you know something is not right then you don't do it and I've always felt that and I felt a lot of the things that are happening now about buildings that are so self-referential and buildings that are trying to scream at people and say, look at me, look at me, look at me. And I say to myself, I can't think of anything less I want. I want to go hide away. I'd rather people go past my buildings and think, that was quite interesting. I'll go back and have another look at that. And then the more you look at something like nature, the more you look at nature, the closer you get into nature, the more beautiful it becomes, in most cases. There's also a very tough side of nature as well. But the beauty of nature is supreme. And if you follow the, the understanding of how things are made and how they go together and how the organisms are working together, I think this is really important. So if what I'm doing is a critique, 
it may be truly the case, but you know, I have to leave that to others to judge, really. Yeah. Um, look, as I said, you, you worked also in a very special way. Uh, since you established your office in 1969, mm -hmm. you work as a uh, sole practitioner, mm -hmm. which is quite unique, so you don't have any collaborators, no secretary, no mobile phone, not a computer either. And what well, really an office because you work from home. Yeah, I, I, I qualify some of these things that you've just stated. I do have a mobile phone, but, no. but, but, but like you, only my family knows the number and I, and I don't. So, <laughs> so uh, the reality is it's for my family to make contact with me when I'm always somewhere else. Um, and in terms of collaborators, what we refer to as a collaborator is probably slightly different to what you refer to a collaborator. Um, a collaborator for us is somebody working in equal capacity, totally equal capacity. They're not employed. So in terms of collaboration, that's one of the great joys in my occupation. With my wife, Wendy Lewin, we collaborated, for example, on our own house. We collaborated on the Arthur and Yvonne Boyd Education Centre. We're going to be collaborating on the Mungo Centre, which is for Mungo Man, Mungo Woman, out in western New South Wales, in the hot arid region, for Abri where Aboriginal people existed 42,000 years ago, that the full bodies have been found. And so that's a wonderful project that's ahead. So that when the scale is of sufficient size to allow the two of us to work, then Wendy is the first person I ask because she's a wonderful architect and person. And I've got to say that our collaboration has always seen us be able to design absolutely equally. We're opposite one another in drawing, both with our pencils. We talk, we discuss it. And if there's anything that the other does not like, we are very open about it. We say it's not good enough. And then we push on and we accept that it's not good enough by the other party. And we look at that opportunity to make it better. So it's not a case of compromising as you say, well, look, I, I'm gonna get angry about this. We, we absolutely have never had an argument in design. So that's the form of collaboration. It's a really equal collaboration. So any of the projects upstairs where you see somebody else's name on it, they have worked with us with me absolutely equally in every respect. So, and, but I don't have a secretary, I don't have staff at all. Um, I found that I decided many years ago that my father said to me, uh, as, I, as I started practice, said, look, remember son, be careful about any, collab any partners you have. It may destroy the very things you want to achieve. So think about it. So I thought about it for a long time. I'll be 80 in four years' time, so I'm still thinking about it. <laughs> <laughs> okay. Uh, okay, you already mentioned that you don't follow the trends in architecture and so on. And uh, once you told me that uh, when you started uh, your own practice, you decided to avoid also publications on architecture. Mm -hmm. That's quite true. Um, I have only uh, Architecture Australia and then a whole lot of other publications coming to me because I know that in a, f f a year's time or two years' time, they're going to make contact with me and say they want to do a publication on my work. And I, I, I know the lead-in for that. So they just send me the publications. But I have not engaged in any publication whatsoever other than Architecture Australia, which we get automatically as being a member of the profession in Australia. So from my very beginning of practice, I have not bought one architecture magazine. But, but, but this was a decision for Yes. What, it was, why? Well, can you explain? Yes, I can explain that. Um, uh, I had worked in practices. I did my course at night time. It was a six-year course, uh, four nights a week, uh, one afternoon, and sometimes all Saturday. So be home at, be home at uh, 10 o'clock at night, work until one o'clock in the morning, and then back to work the next day uh, at nine o'clock. And it was a fairly tough time. Um, then I noticed that a project was be, being designed by a partner, and you think, oh, this is really quite interesting work. And then 
you'd find the magazine would come back into the office four months later, and here is the here is the magazine that's been used as the reference point for some design. And you say to yourself, this surely is not the way to design buildings. You've got to start from the basics to understand the roots of architecture. And to understand that, there's no point jumping in on a building that's any particular building, which does not mean that you are not aware of such buildings. Now, let me say this. My friends as architects were so sorry for me that anything that did come up that they thought was good and I should see, they would photocopy it and send it to me. So I, I had to be honest about that. I was aware of the best things going on. I had very, very, very good people uh, as, uh, uh, as those sorting out the sheep from the goats. Okay, <laughs> okay so then you probably missed uh, an interview with Wim Wenders. Yes. The German. Yes, yes. No, uh, yeah, well, I, yeah. He had a great interview last year. Yeah. In January 2011, yeah. talking about you. Was he? Yeah. Ah. That you met in, in Sydney. Yeah. Where he had a lecture entitled The Sense of Place. You remember that? Oh, yeah. He said that you were a hero of his, and that yeah. he knew all your buildings. Yes, he does. And um, then <laughs> well, in fact, I didn't know any of this, but. Um, he happened to be up in, he was back in, back in Australia, um, where he had visited many times. And I got this phone call and he said, this is Wim Wenders here. Uh, do you know who I am? And uh, of course I said, yes. And uh, he said, I'm up the North Coast. I said, well, I happen to be going up to my house, at the, which I bought with a, with a young architect, by the way. A really important story for all of you here as young architects. When you design a very good house for a client, Keep in mind, you might buy it one day. It's the easiest way to design your own house, which is exactly what I did. And Vim, Vim said, well, I'd love to meet you because I've been talking a lot about your work over the years. And then I said, well, let's call in tomorrow afternoon on your way back to Sydney and spend the afternoon together. And he said, that's fantastic. So he arrived and we got going, talking and we had so much in common, it was absolutely fantastic. So I said to him, Vim, why don't you stay the night here? He said, you sure? I said, sure. He said, I've got to be down for the opening of the exhibition tomorrow night. Um, I'll have to leave here by, by early morning. I said, what time have you got to leave? And he said, oh, about eight o'clock. I said, no, you don't have to go then. Go to 11 o'clock, you'll be there in time for it. And so we both left and he invited me to the exhibition and we got along fantastically. He's a really great man. He's a wonderful guy. He is, yeah. Wonderful guy, but I didn't know anything about this. Okay, <laughs> so I'll tell you now. Thank you. He said in this interview that, uh, uh, that uh, his work is very much related to yours because he works from a sense of place very much like you do. Yes. So that's uh, what I wanted to discuss now. Yeah. The idea of the sense of place. What does it yeah. mean for your work? Yeah, well, if you think of Paris, Texas, yeah. you know, he was very much about placemaking and that, to such a point where he couldn't finish the film, uh, you know, he, and, and he didn't know how to wind that film up. And he said he sent everybody home. And six months later, he thought, ah, yes, I know how to do it. We'll go back into the desert. And that's exactly what he did six months later. But it was all about sense of place. And place is everything to me. It's, it is the most important thing about understanding of architecture. Without understanding place, you're in a very difficult place, let me tell you. To understand the history of that place, to understand whether there has been Europeans trouncing over it for the last 5,000 years, or there may have been actually Aboriginal people only before you, and I could take you to places in Australia and in Sydney where you most likely will be the first European to walk that ground. And to see that ground, it's entirely different to the ground that we as Europeans walk. And to understand the flora, 
to understand the fauna, to when you understand the climatic conditions, when you understand the altitude, you understand the latitude, you start to understand the rainfall, the humidity, the prevailing winds, the sun directions, the climatic changes. When you start to understand all these things, you start to understand water table, you start to understand water runoff, you start to understand the sort of plants that are growing in the soil conditions are there, you'll understand how high those plants grow. When you know those plants that, that are growing there in those soil conditions, you start to know the insects that are going to come to those plants. You also know then the bird life that's going to come for the insects and the plants. And so everything is totally interrelated. You can't take any part of that, that equation out. That is about nature, that's about placemaking. And placemaking is also about the economy of that place, how that place has come about, that stress that's taken in my country, the stress levels of the heat, of the, of the dry, of the dry, of the rain. Remember that last year, in, in part of Australia, Northern Australia, it was underwater, an area equivalent to the whole of France and the whole of Germany. Germany. Australia is a huge place. It's the size of the United States of America. It is, when you look at Europe, it, go, it goes from Western, Western Spain to Jerusalem. That's the size there. And it goes from North Africa to Aulo in Finland. That's the size of Australia. It is huge. So you go from the monsoonal tropics to the wet tropics, to the subtropics, to the warm temperate, to the temperate, to the cool temperate, then coastal, literal rainforest, uh, rainforest, uh, high humidity rainforest, then hot arid, 1,000 meter altitude, cool temperate, even in temperate zone everywhere else. These are all different zones and conditions through which one has the opportunity to respond to. This is not a problem. This is a great opportunity to build according to the climatic conditions, the appropriate materials that are available to understand how we can build in these, the ways that are very simply structured, that if you're in coastal Arnhem land, you need ventilation. For example, European people have thinner noses than the equatorial people. The thinner noses are about the cooler climes. The thinner noses have thinner things to the thin, thinner passages to the lungs, narrow to heat the air, so that lungs don't freeze. That's the principle of it. The equatorial people have much larger noses, much larger nostrils, and larger air to their lungs to get the ventilation. So the people have developed according to the place. So the, not only the people are part of the place, we have developed as part of place in ourselves. So we can tell whether we're from European background or equatorial people background. It's all very, very clear. And when you understand these things, it starts to give the limitations. And limitations can be wonderful because it frees you up to be able to break them very often and, and penetrate them and get something fresh out of it, then move back into the limitation and seeing how you can work it within some of the structured things that you've got to work. And that's what I love, is to discover new possibilities. I don't want to understand anything about the fashions. I don't want to understand about modernism, postmodernism, uh, constructivism, any of the other damn isms that have gone on and gone past, and they will continue to go past. I'm interested in something that has very, very basic levels. I'm interested in things that have an authentic base to them. It's a long answer to your question. No, but about... it's a great one. <laughs> I like it. <laughs> but place is everything about light, ventilation. It's about our responses. Then it comes ourselves. And I love to have a building in a way that you design architecture, whether it be in the country or in the urban fabric, so long as it's not highly polluted, to be able to get the sense of air through, to be able to get the smell of water, rain falling on green grass, or even rain falling on bitumen, and allow the building to think of it in terms of you think of it in the terms of a score in music, where an orchestra is going to be playing and you've got a conductor, and you as the architect become the conductor. And if you actually design a building in a way that it starts to respond to the things around it. So it frames the view. It picks up the most beautiful perfumes that are coming from the northeast winds, past the, the most wonderful native plants of perfumes that are going to waft into the house, or water lilies from the water that are going to waft into the house with the prevailing northeast breezes, or you're going to get insects that are going to fly to a certain point and not get in. 
All these things are about designing a building as if you're playing an instrument. To hear the rainfall on the corrugated iron roof in my country after a drought is a gift beyond anything you can ever understand. It is so beautiful to hear the pitter patter, pitter patter, pitter patter of that rain on the roof. And then the collecting of that rain into tanks that you're going to shower with, that you're going to drink with. This is all about placemaking that makes architecture so extraordinary an activity if you do it this way. It's nothing but beautiful activity. Otherwise, if you're not dealing with it, it can be so boring you might as well all be accountants because you can learn a lot more, earn a lot more money being an accountant than an architect. Okay, uh, let's talk how you work. Uh, how much time do you spend on, on the site before you start working on a project? Mm. Well, you know, as you get more experience, you see more, more quickly. Initially, I would visit a site for a full day I've been known to camp for a couple of days on the site and move around it. The other thing that's important is that I have never been able to do work immediately. So, uh, thank you. Instead of expanding my practice with, as the work came, I expanded time. And so I said to clients, I can't do it now. Can you wait for four months? And many said yes. Then it went to eight months, and then it went to 12 months. Then it went to a year, a year and a half, two years, and up to three years, clients to wait. And what the extraordinary thing is, clients who waited the long period were the most fantastic clients. They were fantastic. <laughs> and those who didn't wait, you knew get rid of them because they wanted everything yesterday and you're not going to be the architect to get them to them yesterday. So those cl clients that waited long periods, I was able to visit the site four, five, six or seven times before. And the other thing was, I said to my clients, remember that in three years time, your 16 year old son is going to be 19 or 20 and starting to think about moving out. Now you're going to adjust your brief accordingly to understand what your patterns will be like in that period of time. So these were in important things to be able to get the client working. Then I'd write to the client and say, I want you to tell me about your life. I want you to tell me about your lifestyle and why you believe I will be able to solve this problem for you, your issues that you're developing for me. So what are the things that I am doing that you are responding to? So I, I would be able to pick all this through. And in a matter of a month and a half, you'd be able to say, yes, this is a really good client. I'm going to be able to work in an appropriate way with this client. And I have also given I've said to clients, I'm not the appropriate architect, but I know a very good architect who would be able to do the sort of work for you because I found that that client was going to ask me to do things I know I ought not do. Now, that is not about arrogance. That is about knowing that you're going to be asked to do something that you really should not ethically do. And yet you know there are other people that won't, that's not about they're unethical about it, but they're not as interested in those sorts of things as I might be. And so it becomes a very different situation. And so I advise them, I introduce the client, and they've had fantastically successful relationships where in fact the client, I've had clients that have worked with me really well, and I haven't been able to do it in time for them for the next project, get sent to another architect, and that other architect's been so successful that they're getting this guy to do another, another job. So I lost the client completely. So that can happen as well. But it's not an issue. Um, that's, that's the way I, I, I deal with it. Uh, you mention quite often that you see architecture as an act of discovery rather than creativity. And that's something mm. I would like to hear about. Yeah. Um, you know, you hear parents say, oh, my child hasn't got a creative bone in its body and it's not going to, it won't do architecture. And I remember people saying that to my late son, Nicholas, 
saying, oh, he'll never do architecture. Yeah, it, uh, and, you know, he said to me all along, he said, no, when people asked him, I know I'm not going to be an architect, because he told he wasn't going to be an architect all the way through. But I took him on a fantastic trip, he and my, he and my other son, Daniel, from Paris down to North Africa into the Sahara Desert, Moroccan Sahara Desert, in wintertime. And most extraordinary experience, we were looking at light, looking at, at people's culture they, in terms of their food, in, to, in terms of their art, in terms of their dress, in terms of the way they, 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 they moved in the street, looking at the squares, what they did in the squares. This was absolutely an extraordinary experience for all of us. And my son was going off to do um, uh, uh, cooking in Paris to learn, because he was working with some of the best restaurants in Sydney. And I got back to Sydney thinking he would be there for six months and who should be there but, but Nicholas. And I said, why are you, what the hell are you home here? He said, because I'm, I'm, uh, I'm going to study architecture. And I thought, my God, uh, he, you've been told all your life you don't want to be an architect and here you are doing it. He turned out to be a really fine architect. And between Nick and Rachel, his, his partner and wife, I'm telling you, they produced some of the best work in young architects in Australia. But sadly, I lost him last year. Anyway, um, in terms of this process, it's, it's a really important one to me. The creative process is not about creativity in the design sense. The creative process is the way you, you, you seek something. And the way you seek it is the process to discovery. And I'm very interested in that discovery. It's too easy to rely on images of other things in what can be a creative thought of as a creative process, in the creative ideas in a building. I'm actually not interested in that one bit. I'm really interested in the process by which we discover. And I've said, any work of architecture that is, is built or has the potential to exist is, in my opinion, a process of discovery. It's not a process of creativity. It is the process through which you discover is the create, creative process, but the actual process of discovery is the most important one. So discovering new ways of doing things. And let me say, that discovery, I believe, comes from the I-hand relationship. We have developed over eons in the understanding between our eye and our hand. And I think you will find in the medical world, they will tell you that our development in our brains has been a consequence of our hands. Our hands have allowed us, our brain, to develop. Now, what is extraordinary, today released is Johanny Palasma's book, The Thinking Hand. And Alish is the, you translated that, Alish? No no, no. No? no? no. Okay. But it's been translated into Slovene and it is a, a, a book that every architect and every student of architecture and any student who wants to think, is a, it's available. The Guardian wrote it up as the most important book for architects and students of architecture written in the last 30 years. To me, he and Johanny is a very close friend of both Alesh and, and uh, of mine, a marvellous man. I recommend you read this because at, in universities today, they've gone like the profession berserk. They are putting kids that are out of school straight onto computers for design. Computers do not design. Let me tell you here and now, computers do not design. Nor did a board, a T-square or a set square design. They were purely instruments that allowed us to realise our thinking. The computer is no different. And let me tell you also that George Steiny, Professor George Steiny from MIT, has, who was a, a, a computer programmer, a, a fantastic mathematician, he has written programs that the computer comes to a gate it can't get through. 
It simply can't get through. The printout, when you do it by hand, you're through the gate before you know you've, you've, you've done it. And you continue, you can complete the whole thing, it's over. Because the hand arrives at solutions, the eye hand arrives at solutions long before you are recognising that it has arrived. And I am now not allowing my students in third year of architecture to do in their final semester any computer drawing whatsoever. They have to do everything by hand until they hand the work in the final presentation can be done in any way they like. So the revelation to my students is, had never understood how fantastic it is to draw, how marvelous it is to be able to have the f freedom and flexibility to get so quickly to a solution. And look at Alto when he wrote, wrote a book called The Line, and look at the number of lines he did, and look how he worked those out. And remember, in Alto changing of direction, if, if you're coming to change direction, he never put it in a full semicircle, another full semicircle. His direction was always a straight line, a movement, circuit, straight line before another curve, which made the curve extraordinarily strong, as opposed to the sloppy curve, which is one curve upon another. The straight line must come in between. The computer's not going to tell you about that. Let me tell you. The hand tells you about this. The eye-hand thinking is a critical aspect of design. And if I ran a school of architecture, and we have the dean here tonight over here, I wouldn't allow any computer drawing in first or first or second year. You would be doing all hand drawing and thinking by hand. That's the way I would be doing it today. And I think it's going to go into that direction because we are, we are part of the fashion of computer technology. And we are just suckers to the computer technology. And I'm simply not interested in that. But I do have a computer, Alex. Oh. Yes. That's <laughs> surprised. So, so uh, on the- But you uh, don't design with computers. Never, not ever. And by the way, nor does Renzo Piano, and nor does uh, Wang Xu, who's won this year's Pritzker Prize. And uh, you can almost name every fine architect that's coming out of, out of, out of architecture these days are still eye-hand thinking, and then the computer takes over, as you would expect, as, as the drawing board did once. It seems that success is quite dangerous for architects, isn't it? Oh, it's dangerous, all right? It's the skids. <laughs> no, I, I mean this because you really work from the sense of place. Yes. But many star architects, they, they deliberately deny it. So it's just completely another uh, professional ethics, I would say. Yes, it is. Um, uh, look, I'm not interested in form making. This is the preoccupation now. It has become the new discipline in universities and the profession is to what form will I make? It's like designing a suitcase and you've got to fit all these grapes into it. And you make these forms that are doing these silly things for the sake of difference. I mean, when you look at the quality of Alto's work, what has been produced in the last 25 years that's going to be better than all this work? It's very hard to think of it in these big, powerful offices that have got all these megabytes in their computers. I mean, it's really extraordinary how mediocre modern architecture is. It's totally mediocre. I know in my country, there has been absolutely no improvement in the quality of commercial architecture, or even domestic architecture as a result of the introduction of computers. And I can tell you that in the 1950s, 60s and 70s, architecture was at a very high plane domestically in my country. I'd say on world class, and that's the time I, I, my education started because the working offices I were in, were, happened to be in were very, very good offices. Some of the best offices in the country. Marvellous way to learn is through that, that, that drafting and drawing and then going on sites with, your, with the architect. It's a beautiful way to learn. But the computer has not released us into something very beautiful. Now, I've taught with Greg Lynn, for example, at Yale. And I said to Greg, 
you know, these are all fine, Greg. How do you get into this building? And he cuts a hole. And I said, that's shocking. I said, Oscar Niemeyer worked this out long before you did. And he, he's his chapel in Brasilia. You went down underground where you didn't, it didn't penetrate. It wasn't necessarily a great solution, but it was the only solution when you got this sort of, these sorts of forms. And I've got to say that computer technology is not giving us these answers. There are many other beautiful answers that come from one's mind. Yeah. Look, but you've received that many honours and awards that uh, people consider you a star architect as well. No, I'm not. I'm just a little architect. Yeah, you don't want to be. Of course I don't. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. uh, no, but how did you feel when you got the Pritzker Prize? Uh, I, I had no feeling left, really. I was a bit numb. Um, look, uh, I'll tell you how it happened. Um, I was teaching at St. Louis. And Wendy phoned me and said, there's a guy by the name of Bill Lacey. He hasn't said who he is, but he wants to speak to you as a matter of urgency. And I said, OK, what's his number? So I rang the number immediately. And it was, it, it was evening, uh, <coughs> morning time in Sydney. And there was a, wasn't anybody there. And I said, look, it's Glenn Merkett here. Um, I've been asked to ring you as a matter of urgency. I will be here this time tomorrow night if you'd like to ring again. So I came down to the office and the, guy, the phone rang right on 7 o'clock at the appointed time, as I mentioned. And he said, Glenn. I said, yes. He said, oh, it's, my name's Bill Lacey. And I said, hello. Uh, and he said to me, um, I see you're teaching in St. Louis. I said, yes, I am. He said, I, um, I was on the Senate there into selecting Markey for the extension to the School of Architecture. I said, oh, yes, I've, I know that uh, that's happening. He said, I can't believe that, that, that is university. He said, they're putting up all these modern buildings and then they clad them in stone to make them look like 19th century Tudor and other, other things. He said, it's just terrible. I said, yeah, I agree with you. And I think to myself, what's happening with this guy? What, who is he? And this is going, this is talking for three, four minutes. Then he paused and he said, um, I don't know how to put this to you, but, but, but to be blunt. And I went immediately into a cold sweat and I thought, my God, what have I done that I ought not to have done? Because I thought he might have been a lawyer or something. <laughs> and you know what they're like. Um, and it's going to be terrible. Anyway, he said, I'm here to tell you you're the recipient of the 2002 Pritzker Prize. And I said, oh, yes. And how do I know it's not one of my friends having a joke on me? <laughs> and we spent, I'm not joking, I spent five minutes giving him all the reasons why he could be having me on because I did not believe it. Anyway... After about six or seven minutes, he started to become quite convincing, and I went into a cold sweat, a complete cold sweat. And I thought, my God, this can't be true. And I said, look, I'm starting to believe you, Bill. I said, I, I hope it's worth it, because I'm in a cold sweat. He said, looks good to have a cold sweat over. And I said, OK, what have I got to do? And he said, well, what I'm, I'm going to do is I'm going to get the executive... Um, Direct, I'm the executive director. I'm going to get the publishing people to contact you. I said, no, you won't. You'll give me their names and I will phone them because I wasn't going to be having another party who was going to be ringing me who could be having a, a joke on me. Anyway, how did I feel? I didn't believe it. And it became a shock. And then three months was taken up with all the requirements of publicity and everything else. Uh, but, of course, it is an amazing thing. It... Uh, it gives you some voice when you go to court cases with lawyers. Um, it's very good when you won a Pritzker Prize and some other things, because when you've got another architect who's trying to pull you apart in front of a judge, it's a bit hard. When it says, well, the, 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 my lawyer would say to the other architect, well, Mr. So-and-so, what prizes have you received internationally? And it's a bit embarrassing for me, I've got to say. So I'm pulled up in, all the time with this sort of embarrassment. but. It has been very helpful to fight court cases, of which I've had 13, only against town planners. 
I suppose there might be some town planners here tonight. They're the bane of my life. Um, uh, I, I, you know, I was telling some friends of mine at lunchtime today, uh, in these court cases, I'm told that my buildings don't blend with the natural environment. Um, they don't harmonise with the natural environment. And so uh, I've defended myself in many of these cases and I've been able to assess that. Uh, I've spoken to musicians and spoken about harmonising. And harmony happens to be disparate sounds, the word disparate, disparate sounds when placed in combination to one another makes a pleasing whole. That is harmony. So you ask the council, you're asking me for harmony. This is the definition of one of the definitions of harmony. Are you asking me to provide harmony or are you asking me to do monotony? And the answer is, of course, they're asking you to do monotony. And so that's demolished very quickly. Now, you can blend an egg, you can blend a, ca blend a cake, but how do you blend architecture with the natural environment? Can you imagine what a mess it would be, putting it into an egg beater and blowing it all up into making this combination? So it's all nonsense. These words that they use to, 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 to reject your work are marvellous things because you can go to court and win the case. So I've lost one case of the 13, which is a shame. Um, the 13th would have been nice to have won, but I didn't. And so it's certainly blending and, and uh, harmony are integral to winning those cases. So what has it meant to me? It's, it's meant it's given me a voice on the whole. Um, other than that, it means that it, it, it means very simply that any work that one has done of the past that has been regarded as decent work makes every new work vulnerable. That's what it does. And it, it's a very nerve-wracking issue because you've got to maintain standards where previously you maintained your own standards independent of everything else, but you know there are a thousand eagle eyes looking at what you're doing. So it's very nice to work in such an isolated way, knitting one plane, one pearl on my eyebrows for the last 49 years. Uh, okay, I'd like to go back to your re special respect for nature. Mm -hmm. I think it has something to do with your childhood in yes. Papua New Guinea. Yeah. You grew up among uh, the Kuku Kuku people, mm -hmm. the cannibal people. Yes. Mm -hmm. So observing nature was very yeah. important for yeah. you, isn't it? Yeah. Um, <clears throat> uh, I returned, I was, my parents decided to go to the 1936 Berlin Olympics. And they returned to New Guinea in 1937. And I remained there until 19, late 41 when the Japanese arrived. And that period of my childhood was so significant because I was raised by three, four wonderful young Papua New Guineans, Minjo, Asika, Wallen and Quack. And my memory of them today is as sharp as it was when I, when I left. And we left on scorched earth policy. But the most important thing about that childhood in New Guinea was we were surrounded by wonderful rivers. We were surrounded by grasslands and then huge rainforests. And within the rainforests lived the Kukukuka people. And these people were the cannibals. And our neighbour of, of 10 miles away, uh, uh, by a neighbour by the name of Boom Boom, was killed and he was eaten, and his head was put in a bag and left on Surprise Creek Airfield. And this was a, incredibly frightening as a child to know the cookers would actually take you, they'd kill you. And we were living in their country. The reality was we had imposed ourselves on their country. And my father was mining gold, alluvial gold, which I thought might have been a terrible form of mining, but it actually was one of the gentlest forms of mining. You disturbed the bottom, which was a fast-flowing river. You extracted the gold on sluice gates. You retorted the, the material and put it into ingots. And it was quite straightforward. But the biggest difficulty was the sense that you, the vulnerability, the sense that you're going to be attacked. So the whole time you were listening, you were smelling, you, you were observing the ins of things, looking, smelling, observing, hearing, and all these little changes, you'd be very carefully watching them. And so growing up in New Guinea, automatically taught the three elder children to observe. And that was really, really significant 
to be able to look to see what's happening, to see what's happening around you, to have a, a, a breadth, of, breadth of vision, to know what's happening there and what's happening there and there, and in a very short time what's happening there. And so you'd be waiting for the winds to come out from the rainforests. And these winds would bring the smell of the smell of the New Guinean people, the cookers, and you knew they were coming. And at five o'clock you'd see sometimes, not every day, but once every four or five weeks, you'd see this slight line like a snake line coming down in the kunai grass. The kunai grass was 1.5 metres high. The kuka kuka was maximum 1.49 metres high. So they were just below the head of the grass and you'd see the grass moving as they came through. Then everything stopped. And then the chief would come out and shape up, come up to my father and he'd get my, want my father to sit down and if my father sat down, the next thing, out came the axe in the back, bang, gone. Well, my father knew this. My father happened to be one of Sydney's leading Southpaw boxers. Now, Southpaw, somebody leading from the left. My father was a man that was 1.8, uh, nearly 1.8 metres high. He was a very tall man, very much unlike the rest of us as children. And he had a huge reach. And as soon as the cooker came up to him and asked him to sit down, without knowing my father, to turn around, bang, knock him to the ground. And he had a handful of pepper. And this cooker would go screaming back. And you see the snake going straight up the hill again. Now, this was the only message that was understood in those days because physical force, the, 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 the great physical force represented the highest level of humanity there for the people. And whilst I regard it today as shocking, totally shocking, because we were there on their land, as I said before, it nevertheless gave me a, a real ability to observe. And that is something that was really important. So nature, the wind, the forest, the grasses, the water, all these things gave us a real sense of those conditions. And furthermore, we had at two o'clock every afternoon, big build up of storm, huge thunderclaps, lightning, the rains came down in tor torrents up to the order of 100 millimetres in half an hour. Absolutely unbelievable rainfall. And then shortly after the sun would come out. Now, this sort of climatic change in one day was phenomenal. And that allowed me to observe, again, climatic variations. And then going down to the coast, where it was incredibly humid, another climatic variation. Then coming back to Sydney once a year, the climatic variation again. So the contrast between these things gave me an ability as a child to understand differences in climatic conditions and difference in placemaking. When we had our, had our mail delivered, the mail was delivered by air, literally by air, where a gypsy moth would fly around about 30 metres above the ground, very tight bank, and out of the cockpit throw our letters in a bag with a big red tail on so it lay over the kunai grass so you could find it. And also Christmas presents and Christmas cakes and everything else came by air, really by air. Now, can you imagine coming to Sydney and then you see a postman coming down the street blowing a whistle with a bag on his back. These contrasts from childhood are so powerful in my memory that they gave me a real ability to observe everything around me. My kids used to say, when I knew something was happening, how did you know I was doing it? I said, there's another sense, son, another sense I have about this. That's why you get caught every time, every time you get caught. And they couldn't believe it, but it was true. Okay, you mentioned your father. He was very important, I think, for your architectural career, wasn't he? And for your respect for nature. Yes. Um, my father, instead of uh, spending his money on alcohol and all the other things that many people in New Guinea did then, he used to come to Sydney and buy beautiful land, absolutely un constructed land by Europeans. It was the most beautiful land on Sydney Harbour. Unbelievable. And he loved architecture. He also loved psychology and, and 
he had uh, uh, the very first prints of Freud's work, and he had them in New Guinea as a young man, up in the up in the Highlands, and reading Freud. And he had architectural record and architectural forum uh, sent to him uh, throughout my childhood, and anything that he thought thought was extremely interesting, like Philip Johnson's house, like Richard Neutra's work, like the work of Miss in the Farnsworth house, uh, Gordon Drake, I was introduced to Gordon Drake. Very few American people know about Gordon Drake. Maybe not many people here know about Gordon Drake. Look him up. There's a new book that's been published, republished by William Stout on Gordon Drake. There's some really beautiful Californian houses. And so I would have to read from the age of about 11, read all these articles that my father thought were important for me to read. And then he would challenge me with questions. You know, I didn't get the answers right. Read it again until you get the answer right. Start understanding the principles. Don't look at the building, look at the principles. He also had a joinery shop. I used to have to work in the joinery shop where I learned to build staircases, cabinets, all sorts of, all sorts of timber things, and then eventually learned to build racing sailing skiffs. So I built racing sailing boats uh, as skiffs, small boats that are in the order of four metres long only, but they were these plywood and framed things and they just whizzed over the water. They were fantastic things to, to be sailing. So I was, dealing with, I was dealing with materials. I started to understand materials. I carried bricks. I bent reinforcing. I laid reinforcing. I made concrete, four, two and one. It was the, was, was the mix for footings. Four, 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 um, four, four gravel, uh, t two sand, one cement was the mixture to put in to, and don't put too much water in and make sure it's pretty dry and put it into the foundation. Make sure all those roots are out of the foundations. Get it clean, son, get it clean. And then learning to make bricks. We made our own cement bricks. Uh, he, he imported a machine that made t uh, fi five bricks at a time. And so that was fantastic. So I've made, I've made these cement bricks. I've laid bricks. I've done rendering. I've done painting. I've, I've done most of the things except electrical and plumbing. I haven't done those sorts of things myself. But it is incredibly important to understand materials in architecture because most architecture you see coming out of the computer, it's flimsy sort of plast plasterboard stuff. It's almost all plasterboard. You ask them what the material is. Not very few now understand what the material is. I have no idea what it is. Materials are a very important thing. Louis Kahn said, what does it want to be? The brick. It, it, what it is, is a compressive material. It's a material that only works in compression properly. If you put it into tension, it fails. So try and put brickwork into, into tension in, an art, in, in a span and it'll fall out. It's, it's a problem. But it's not a problem if you understand the nature of the brick and the nature of all the materials. Take a beam that's spanning a distance. In timber it won't do it, and, st and, and a thin piece of steel won't do it. But put it in a combined, in a composite construction as, as a flitched beam with timber cheeks and a central, central steel fin, then you've got the compression in the timber working beautifully, the, the timber holding the steel really ver vertically. The steel works fantastically in tension, so you've got the both things working together to make the whole much better. Than, than any one of them would be working themselves. These are beautiful things. It's the nature of the material. And if you start to understand the major, nature of the material, it's like language. If you have a very good vocabulary in your language, you can write poetry, you can write prose, you can write beautifully. If you don't have that vocabulary, you can't do it. And the vocabulary is no different in architecture. If you have a vocabulary about materials, you understand how they work. This is, it's, this is critical in architecture. It's nothing to do with about computer, fa f f f oh, I'm not going to talk, uh, uh, computers anyway. <laughs> it, it's nothing about that. It's about understanding proper materials. Now I've got, I don't have anything against the computer. I use it all the time for word processing. I use it for writing letters. I use it for all sorts of things. It's also marvellous for, for working up modules. When I want a module to work that's going to work for, for timber, a module that's going to work for bathroom, a module that's going to work for glazing, for economic glazing, a module that's going to work for living room, a module that's going to work for, for a, a storeroom. 
then I can start to find whether what, what that module is going to be that's going to allow me the best module to give me the maximum span that I can have for a sheet of material of, of plasterboard without putting battens in and using the main rafters, or it's going to be more economical to have main rafters and a lot of battens. It's marvellous for that sort of thing. It's, a, it's an instrument that's wonderful. So don't let, give me the impression, don't let me give you the impression that I can't stand them. I love them, but love them for certain purposes. So uh, uh, my view is that you really have to understand those materials to be able to, to, to do architecture well. And I was given all this by my father. Now, he said to me, I wouldn't, I'd be 50 before I understood what he was giving me. He said, I, he said, I know I'm a pain to you, son. You have no school holidays. You come down here and work in, the, in my joinery shop in holidays, but you'll appreciate it as you get older. He was right, finally. Absolutely right, finally. I didn't love it so much at the time, let me tell you. I found it very, very hard going to think you worked all year and you, the day after you finished your, your, your school, you're into the, into the workshop having to do all these other, these other things. And as far as taking girlfriends out, he didn't care if you got back in 12 o'clock at night or 1 o'clock in the morning. You still were up at 6 o'clock in the morning and you would have to, have to go to the joinery shop. Before that, you'd be up at 5 o'clock in the morning in summer and down to the half a mile down to the swimming baths. It was miles in those days, kilometres these days. Half a mile swim before school, back half mile at home. Wash, wash, my job was to wash the bathroom, half an hour music practice, piano practice, then a two-mile walk, two, a two mile and a half walk to school. Do a couple of swims, a, a couple of 100-metre dashes, um, down around the minute mark for the 100 metres, then do a half mile swim. When you've all done that, we can go home. Go home, do your homework, have dinner, half an hour music practice, go to bed, then five o'clock the next morning, the orange juice, you'd hear, the, hear his feet coming down the hall with his orange juice. You thought, oh my God, here comes the orange juice again. It's time to get up. <laughs> so I still drink orange juice. <laughs> so yes, my father was enormous influence. And a very good one for me, and a very good one for my younger brother, uh, and was not very good for my younger sister, and was very good for my youngest sister, and not very good for my youngest brother. Um, so it worked for some of us, it didn't work for all of us. Um, uh, it wasn't a universal love in that sense, but he was a, a, an amazing father. I've got to say, an amazing father. But I was also thinking of uh this special respect for nature. It came yeah. with two raw writings, yeah. perhaps. Yeah. Okay. Um, you know, <clears throat> when everybody were planting petunias and, and marigolds and, and flocks and all the other European plants, he would take me at night time into the hillside where I grew up, where the septic tanks had come, and they were killing, the septic tank nutrients were killing all the native plants. The nutrients were too high, water table was too high. So he took the soil, stole the soil from people's gardens. There weren't fences. So we'd just go through the bush at night time, co collect the soil, take it home, and then he would propagate the various plants that were able to withstand from the area, he, he got seeds from the area, for eucalypts, he put them in the oven, the pods in the oven, to fire them in the oven so that the seed would pop open because eucalypts require fire to, 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 to germinate. You, you require boiling water over acacia seeds. And then he'd plant them in this high nutrient soil and they would grow. And then he'd write a little botanical tag on them and then go back into these people's places where he'd taken the soil from. And we'd plant these, these plants with these botanical names and nobody knew who was, who was donating all these plants. These looked like they'd been propagated by a nursery, were being planted in all these people's places. And today they're, they're in the order of 15 and 25 and 30 metre high trees. They're absolutely fantastic in the hillside. And we were doing that. His love for nature extended to the point where if somebody cut down a beautiful tree, he would go and blast them for cutting the tree down. There was no need to, blast, to cut this tree down. This is a, an, an ancient tree. It was so important. And then came bonfire night. And on bonfire night was, was in November and people, kids would start cutting trees down just for the big fire you put on the beach. And he had a loud hailer and he'd scream out, stop cutting it on those bloody trees. 
And we go to school the next day, and the kids say, Jesus, there's a madman living out of your way. And we were terrified of, of being identified as the children of this madman. But he scared the life out of the kids all around the neighborhood about chopping. No more trees were chopped down. When we traveled, we had the first back to front car, the Studebaker, in 1949 48, designed by Raymond Lowy, which was called the back to front car because it was the first car that had a back not that dissimilar to the front. It was a very amazing looking vehicle. And my father uh, made us have, we had a rubbish bag in the car and all rubbish went into this bag. It was so important. And I remember one day my father giving chase to, to a family that had thrown rubbish out of the car. He stopped immediately, picked it all up and gave chase to these people. And he caught them, blew the horn and they pulled over and he got out of the car with all this rubbish. And he said to them, you threw the, you dropped this out of the car. And they said, we didn't need it. And he said, nor does the planet need it, and threw it into the car. And these were the parents of our friends. And we were terrified. We are totally mortified as children. He was totally eccentric. We had seven pianos in the house, would you believe? Seven pianos, two Steinways, Beckstein, a, 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 a Challen, a, a Fido Bing, a Bentley. I just go on. And then he bought more pianos and built new soundboards for them. And then we all we were swimmers. My br brother was a national champion of Australia in swimming at the age of 12. And we had our own swimming pool and own, his own, own swimming techniques. We had a life belt around us. He bought from America rubber band the thickness of my thumb and tied on the back of you in a small pool. And you had to swim against this rubber band. Well, we all turned out to be good swimmers. But he said, because all, all our hair was going green because it was copper sulfate in the water. He said, oh, we can't do that. get your caps. So what does he do? Not buy five caps for the kids. He goes out and buys 144 caps. So everything was done in, uh, totally exaggerated. He was absolutely eccentric in many ways, but he was also wonderful. He was just the most wonderful father. Colourful, so colourful. He had the first European costume, which only had a little little V up here, and it was all net around here. And we, we as children, this, said to him, we're not going to go to the swimming bars and racing. If you wear those, we're not going to be with you. He was a total embarrassment. <laughs> okay, let's go back to your works. Uh, <laughs> so you like to compare them with uh, sailing boats and airplanes. Yeah, yeah. So can you tell more about that? Yeah. Um, I've got to first of all say I had a very difficult education. Um, coming from New Guinea, I only spoke pidgin English. My parents thought best known to them that uh, I should learn English before I went to school, otherwise I'd be given hell at school. Well, it probably would have been better for me to go to school f for that. But I found it hard, I found it boring. I didn't want to know that the Battle of Hastings was 1066 and the whole of history was about these battles and it just was so terrible, it was so awful, I couldn't bear it. My f uncle, who was, who was a pilot, he's now 94, marvellous man, he gave me a book, Principles of Flight by Cam. And at the age of 12, I started to understand the mathematics of flight. I understood the whole principles of lift, so that you have an aerofoil section like that, like that, then a particle of wind of air splitting here, it, it will arrive at the same place there and meet itself to join itself and it has to go much further this way, therefore to do that, got to go faster. To go faster produces a negative pressure, positive pressure underneath, positive pressure moves to negative pressure, suction gives you lift. And so I then started designing my own small, up to two metre wingspan gliders and initial rubber, rubber uh, driven, propeller driven uh, aircraft and then into, into remote control aircraft. I designed all these things, they were absolutely wonderful to be doing, I experimented with those and I really wanted to become an aircraft designer. I thought air, the, this model was fantastic to be doing in aircraft, but I also designed sailing boats and I saw the relationship that if you look at the sail on a boat which is that sort of a shape from a mast, then when you've got a wind blowing in this direction, you get the wind going over that path, it's got to go faster which creates a suction with a, with a positive pressure on this side. This suction that's doing this is pulling the boat forward, so it's the very same principle. It, 
exactly the same principle as flight. And then when you look at the keel, and the keel was very understandable why Australia won the America's Cup from the Americans long ago with the particular sort of keel, which had was the keel coming down with, with a, a, a plane on the base of it, which is if you turn it sideways now, you look at the aircraft of today, it stops the spilling of air off the end of and the vortice that takes place on the end. And the vortice that takes place on the end of an aircraft wing slows the aircraft down, becomes less efficient. If you can hold the air, that, that air back so you get absolutely clear flow, then it produces a greater efficiency for the aircraft movement. And the same thing is for the keel of a boat. If you have the keel coming down, tapering down like a wing, then there's a vortice that takes place behind that keel which slows the boat down. And that's why the Australians had beat the Americans on, on, that, on that, that particular race. Now, sailing boats and aircraft are, are both areas that gave me an, an, an understanding of wind and how wind works around buildings. For example, if I was to design a building in the snow country, then I would know how to deal with the entrance of that building in relation to the snow and prevailing winds in the direction that the snow may come from, so that the wind is clearing the entrance all the time so you don't have to dig it out all the time. You could design a building to look at how the snow moves over it. I had students in Penn where we were working on the, the stable dune areas and there was a lot of sand coming so we had them make models and, 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 and we had them tested in wind tunnels looking at how the sand in movement would come over their design of their buildings and move over and not come into the buildings themselves and they discharge in, in other parts at certain times of the year. And this was, this was critical to my my love of understanding the scientific principles behind things. So I love science. I love, I love the matter of, of factness of it. I love the, the inevitability of it, the inevitability of all things. I love architecture to have an in inevitability about it. The idea that Australia produced a very interesting building in Queensland, which was a big house with a veranda around it. And in summertime, people lived on the veranda. And it occurred to me, why do you have the house when you're going to, for most of the year, going to be living on the veranda? Why did you design the house narrow enough to get the air through, which is what they wanted, so it became this narrower house? And then you could then orient it in my climatic condition, where you're not worried about the cold all the time, to be able to get a very efficient climatic condition through the building. And Alice has been to my place at Kempsey, and you'll know the climatic conditions there work very well. And, and the, the thing is this, that it's these principles of sailing, of aircraft. And I was in national service in aircraft uh, in, 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 uh, in my 20s, and so in flying. And so this was all critical to my understanding of how wind moves around a building and how you can get it to work for you. So the wind becomes an element like a material you're working with. Light is a material we work with. Wind is a material we work with. Water is a material we work with. These are all materials that we're able to, to use. And so aircraft design air, and sailing boat design had a very big influence on me, which was just an integral part of my life from the age of 12 to the age of 20 when I was building the boats and sailing them and, and building model aircraft and flying them. These were fantastic things to be developing. And as my son said, he can see in my work absolutely my interest in flight and sailing as, as a consequence of those teenage years. So you never use uh, air conditioning, isn't it? No. Um, I have in a couple of houses They've, they've insisted on air conditioning to be available. And I've got to say, uh, they, they've contacted me years and years later and said, you know, we only had all that air conditioning put in and we've used it twice in the last five years. And so my view is, well, suffer if it's going to be four or five days in the last five years. And if you're a little bit cold in the house sometimes, put a sweater on you know, a nice woolly pair of socks. And if you really want to get really warm and look at television, put a blanket over your knees, it's all right too. So the reality is um, air conditioning is not something I work with. 
Uh, in the hottest of climes, for example, up in the, the eastern Arnhem Land, which is 11 degrees south of the equator, where the temperature during summertime is 32 degrees almost every day. In wintertime, it drops back to 28 degrees. The difference being that the humidity in summertime is 90% to 95 to 100%. In wintertime, it's down to 30%. And so you get a completely different sort of uh, feeling. And the, the only thing I can say is that in the hottest part of Australia, the only complaint my client had was that she had to put on a sweater in some summer days because it was a bit cool. And that's not a bad complaint. Uh, okay, let's talk a little bit, and we are close to finishing, huh? uh, about sustainability. Oh, okay. Frampton somewhere described your work as proto-ecological building culture. Mm -hmm. So you practice sustainability decades before architects start to discuss these things. Yeah, so well, how would you comment the, the contemporary uh, well, discussions about sustainability? The, the Americans developed a word called greenwashing. Um, as opposed to whitewashing something. And the reality is the things that are really sustainable in architecture are not the materials in the, the initial use, but post use for the second use or the third use, so long as that can be easily re re retrieved, can have a second life and a third life. And I'm using materials that have had second and third lives. And that may be towards a sustainability. So it means that you've got to put buildings together in a way that you can retrieve them by simply unbolting them or unscrewing things. So gluing uh, and the like uh, d does not have that sense of sustainability. Um, to orient the building in the appropriate directions in the climatic conditions is certainly sustainable. In other words, you actually design a building that in, in summertime, it, it excludes the summer light where we have it in, in parts of it, most parts of Australia, uh, where it's too, too hot, the glare is, the, height, the, the light level is too high. And so you prefer to actually exclude all the sunlight in summertime, where our sun rises in summertime 30 degrees south of east, and the sun in our sky is on the northern sky. It's not in the southern sky like here. So whenever you see a building of mine that shows the north point and with all the, the place open to that side, you know that that's where the sun is on that side, not the southern side. And not a lot of people really understand that. Not even a lot of architects understand that. And so um, uh, my view is that in the sustainability issues, by eliminating the sun in summer, but by designing it so that you receive it in winter. And so that uh, you go further north to the Arnhem Land, you don't want any sun in the building at all. And all you want is the wind air coming through off the sea um, and the coastal areas to, to pass through the building. That becomes a sustainable element. To be able to look out of a building and not be seen uh, is also a sustainable thing, so you don't need blinds, you don't need particular sorts of glasses, because glass is hopeless in that area because we have cyclones, and the, in such a building as the one you see up on the screen there now, um, that building uh, could be pulled apart, it's all screwed together, uh, all the joists are bolted down, everything can, all the joints of the steelwork are bolted together, all of that could be, in a, in, in a sense, completely reused. All the sheets of iron could be reused. Everything in that house can essentially have another life. Now that perhaps is partly towards sustainability in that sense. Um, in in winter time, if you get into the colder climes, you need to get your buildings down onto the ground. You use the ground as part of the thermal mass to keep your building at a more even temperature. You actually then have a in my part of the world where you get the cold south uh, southwest winds off the snow country you have uh, a thermal mass on the inside you insulate that thermal mass on the outer side with a lightweight material on the outside of that again and therefore you've got your thermal mass on the inside you have deep winter penetration of sunlight onto a dark floor that is probably sustainable which reduces the amount of heating and light you require keeps you warm in winter cool in summer that is partly to do with sustainability 
being able to use materials that are local. For example, the house in Kempsey, all the material came within a, a distance of about 60 kilometres, uh, except the corrugated iron. That came from, uh, from Brisbane, which is halfway exact, uh, our place is halfway between Brisbane and Sydney, and, uh, and yet it's made down south of Sydney. So it's taken all the way to Brisbane and back again. So that is in its sense not sustainable, but on the other hand, it has a zinc aluminum finish, which gives us at least uh, uh, over 50 years, maybe uh, maybe 100 years. Well, it's not almost 50 years old. Well, it's 38 or something years old now, and it's going extremely well for the material. Uh, all the timber work is tallow wood, using the appropriate material. Tallow wood in Australia is the Eucalyptus microcores. It's one of the most durable timbers in the world. In fact, it's one of the five of the eight most durable timbers in the world. It has a high oil content. To use that very local material and bolt it together is probably sustainable because I, I, I once had a pergola on that building and I've, re, I've rebuilt uh, much of, the, much of a, a very primitively built shed in the use of all that pergola. So it had beautiful tallow wood outside for 10 years and I was able to retrieve all of that and reuse it in the, the other building so that is probably sustainable it again is all bolted together and the ceilings are screwed on that can all come down again um, that's perhaps sustainable uh, harvesting your own water for your use is probably sustainable um, not heating the house with electricity is probably towards sustainability but if you're using gas it's probably a little bit better than electricity to heat to heat, heat the hot water uh, with your own water in that storage to have a huge pond of water down there, which you can use for watering gardens, that's probably sustainable. Um, they're the sort of things that are sustainable, but in terms of sustainable architecture, when you look at most buildings, there's nothing very much sustainable about them all at all. And you must say that it's the industry that's got hold of this whole area of sustainability and given it hell because you think everything's sustainable. Um, even petrol becomes sustainable. And so you start to wonder what really is going on. It becomes a joke. So most sustainability is a joke, whereas I think there can be sustainability in our occupation. And it's a way of thinking, and it's a way of designing, it's a way of planning. And so all I can say is I'm trying to do reasonable things. For example, in the Boyd Centre, uh, all the timber work in that building, the Arthur M. Yvonne Boyd Education Centre, is second-hand material and some of it's third-hand material. All the bricks are new. Uh, on the paving, but those bricks are all laid on sand. All the bluestone is laid on some cement because we need to contain the sand. And we have geofabric over every little outlet to stop the sand going through. So all the brickwork is on sand. And therefore, if we ever want to renew any part, if we want to get to any service, we can take the bricks up, we can get to that, that service. We've got hot water coming up all through those, those areas. We can always get to it. So that is probably sustainable. The idea of putting uh, a, a gap between the, the thermal mass on a wall, the insulation, and the final finish on the wall, where you can unscrew the wall sheeting and get to all the services in that cavity that might be 50 to 70 metres deep, you can get to every service without breaking tiles inside. If you want to put a new tap in, you can drill in from, from the back. And then you put all the sheets back into where they were. There is, there is no pulling the house apart as such. Everything being pulled apart goes back in. When I did the alteration to the house at Kempsey, the, the veranda was made in tallow wood. The inside floors are a brush box, which is Tristania. And the tallow wood I was able to unbolt on the building, to take the gable end off, pull the gable end out three bays further down, roll the, roll the, 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 the veranda out on 44-gallon drums, re-bolt them all up, take the window out that was for a bedroom there, put it up into this area for the living room, for the stairs, bring the stair from there up to this new part. That, by the way, is the new Opal and Fossil Centre that Wendy and I are doing, this one here. And that's, that slit down the middle there is only for the model's sake. It, it obviously goes all the way through. Um, <clears throat> So there, there are a lot of these issues in sustainability that we can deal with that I think are really important. And in, in the Boyd Centre, we collect our own water for drinking. We, we have a, a subterranean water for fire uh, as a fire service. That is probably towards sustainable. Uh, we have a rotating bio biological digester. It does use power to turn this rotating but we have gravity feed out over to the fields. It doesn't, and the, 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 the aeration 
of this, of this soil, the waste system, produces uh, the nitrates and the phosphates are evaporated, so the water that comes out and the sludge that comes out is fairly inert. And so it just is spread over the fields. We've had EPA, it's the Environmental Protection Authority, testing done on it. There is no pollution coming into the river systems or into any of the catchment area. It's all working. We're not having to take it to a, a, a waste management place. It's, we're done on our own site and we're making it the mess on our own site. We, we've got to bear with that mess. Well, it's not doing that. So that's perhaps getting towards some level of sustainability. So we're supplying our own water. We're supplying our own uh, waste management uh, systems. We don't supply the power because at this stage, um, photovoltaics, and then yet I've installed up the largest photovoltaic uh, cell system in the southern hemisphere for domestic residents. Um, and it supplies all the power needs and underfloor heating and everything and feeds back into the grid uh, during the day when we don't need it and when we turn it on, we, we draw from the grid. So that may be, to some extent, sustainable. But let me say, after 16 years, that grid has to be rethought about and renewed, and the batteries need renewing, all that sort of stuff. So there's a question about sustainability in the whole photovoltaic cell industry. But as my client said, unless we do it, how are we going to advance? So if we buy it, it allows advancement in the technology. So we might get some a, a, a sufficient advancement where it will become sustainable. These are the possibilities. We have now what's called blue gen, where it converts very efficiently gas in, into uh, hydrogen and water. And using both is fantastic. It's a very economic system. One of these gen, which is the size of a washing machine, is able to provide enough power to service three domestic residences and now they're being installed by government in lots of government housing. This is happening. That may be to some extent towards getting a better, better use of, of energy systems. I think it's enough, isn't it? It is. Yeah. But I have two more questions. Okay. okay. The first one is that uh, your architecture work has a worldwide influence, but uh, and you were teaching abroad a lot in several countries. But at the same time, the architects were saying that uh, one cannot apply our principles outside Australia. Do you agree with that? No, I don't. You can apply the principles, but you can't apply the, apply the aesthetics. Exactly. That's what I wanted to hear, yeah. Okay. Yeah, the principles are transferable. Tr principles are transferable. Where does the wind come from? That's transferable. Where does the sunlight come from? Where, that's transferable. Where does the snow come from? Where the, where's the prevailing cold wind? Where's the prevailing hot wind come from? Is there no wind? They're the questions. The questions are transferable. The answers are different. Uh, and the, the last question is that most of your projects are one-family houses. So uh, is it possible you think that uh, to work the same way with large projects. Yeah, um, th there is, there is absolutely. Well, you see the museum uh, that was the large, was shown on here. Now that that's a that's a you can't call it a large project, but it's twenty five million dollars worth, and that becomes a it becomes a large project. Now that also is is working with natural systems. The whole of that's working with wind going through various parts over water to the cool. We have a lot of water subterranean. We can pass over that water and we can cool through the latent heat of evaporization. But the water further down is 56 Celsius. So we can bring that water up into the building. We can bring it then turn it back down in, into, the, into the ground. So we're using the heat of the earth to be able to heat the building and also cool the building. So that is probably sustainable as well because the water's not coming up and then going out on the ground to flood a plain. It's going back into the ground where it came from, into the water and it will be heated again in, in that ground. Um, so, of course, these are principles uh, are, that can be, uh, be, be done in, in major, major buildings. The reality is, for me, um, most of the clients that do these major buildings are sitting on a, on a, on a site for, for five years, then all of a sudden they say, we want this building, we want this, the, the excavators in in nine months' time. 
And in nine months' time, from my point of view, they're still waiting. So nobody comes to me who knows that they're going to have to be told to wait for nine months or 15 months or two years. So I haven't been able to get those sort of projects. But interesting enough, the projects are now getting much more interesting. And my father did say to me, son, never be in a rush to be a success. So I've taken him at his word, actually. So it's taken me till now, the age of 76, to be able to get some of these bigger buildings. And so in these bigger buildings, they will be the same principles placed into those as I'm using in the smaller buildings. And the smaller buildings, let me tell you, as Johanny Pallism said, um, in doing a studio he had done in, in Finland that was much more complicated than the building he did for the interchange for the services uh, and the building over the railway exchange in Helsinki. He said it was much more difficult. And let me tell you, if you're going to do a house really well, there's a hell of a lot of thinking that's got to go into it. Much more complicated than a multi-storey office building. Let me tell you, having worked on multi-storey office buildings, they're a singe. A lot of money to be made in those. So you can, if you want that, that's what you want. Money, go for that. But if you want to do decent architecture, well, don't, don't expect that sort, of, that sort of economy in your life. Were you ever asked to design an office tower, for instance? Yes, I have. And how did you respond? I said, uh, can you wait for, for three years? And he said, no, I can't wait for three years. So I said, we'll go to Harry Seidler. <laughs> okay, thank you, Alain Thank you, thank you.